everyone, we're just going to give everyone a couple of minutes to, to gather and then uh, we'll get started. We'll just wait another couple of minutes, then we'll get started. Yeah, yeah. Take yeah, as much time as you need. We'll give another minute and then um, we'll, we'll, we'll begin. I, I guess we'll get started and um, hopefully uh, people will straggle in. Um, I, I actually have the honor today of hosting the Grand Rounds. Um, this is sort of a bittersweet time. It's, it's the end of the year and this is the time where we sort of uh, have our fellows give um, the Grand Rounds when they sort of uh, showcase their research um, today. And it's also bittersweet because it marks the end of the career of our seniors and, and many of which are leaving for bigger and better things. Um, today, we're really, really privileged because both Abi Mukherjee and Fadi Ibrahim are gonna um, present their research. They did a, a sort of a cooperative research project. Um, and I wanted to say a couple of things about each one of them. First of all, it's been a privilege and an honor to have you guys as fellows. Um, Abi, um, kind of both Abi and Fadi have like the ultimate immigrant uh, success story. Uh, Abi immigrated here with his family when he was very young, about four years of age, and they settled in New Jersey. Uh, he went on to study biochem biomedical engineering actually at Hopkins and then pursued his medical school, University of Pittsburgh. Um, we were really, really lucky that Abi then decided to come back home and come back to New Jersey, and he did his residency at Robert Wood Johnson. And then we were even more fortunate that he decided to choose us for, to pursue his cardiovascular fellowship. Um, next year, Abby's going to the University of Florida at Jacksonville, where he's going to do a year of interventional cardiology. On a personal note, last year in 2021, um, Abby got engaged and turns out that his fiance is also a, a cardiology fellow in training. Um, and uh, once he's done with his interventional training, he's going to plan on going to Houston and they're going to be together and um, you know, we wish him the best of luck and, and it, it's an honor that he's gonna, you know, present today. Uh, Fady's got a similar story. He, he and his family immigrated when he was at a young age from Egypt and Fady settled in Queens. Um, he went on to do biochemistry and also a, a double major in sociology at SUNY Stony Brook. Um, I know Fady since he's a medical student when he went to do his medical school at Downstate. Uh, we, we won't talk about that experience. It was very memorable for me. And then uh, Fady did his residency at North Shore um, and then came, came to us and did his cardiovascular fellowship. And he's been our chief fellow and he's done an incredible job. Fady got married in May and uh, is gonna also leave us and head to San Diego where he's gonna go to Scripps and pursue an interventional fellowship. Uh, both of them are, are have incredible leadership qualities and we are really, really honored. Today, they're, um, and I, I don't wanna do a disservice to their topic. Uh, their topic will be a research project that they came up with to look at the utility of valve and valve. And they're gonna break it up as sort of, uh, Fadi's gonna give us an introduction, the impetus to the study, and Avi's gonna go through 
the results and you know future considerations. So with that, I'm going to open the platform to Fadi. Um, how we're going to do this is Fadi's going to go first. Avi's going to go second. I'm hoping that Dr. Hakeem and Dr. Chowdhury will join us and they're going to moderate for a few minutes. And we're going to do something a little different at the end because it's more intimate and it's our fellows. Um, I'm going to open it up for the last uh, five, 10 minutes and you guys can directly ask them questions. Um, with that, Fadi, uh, you're on. And All right. Thank you, Dr. Kasotis. I'm just going to share my screen. It was an amazing introduction and uh, it is the beginning of a bittersweet end, and we thank you and all the faculty, and thank you to everybody who's uh, with us this evening. So the uh, topic that both Avi and I have worked on is regarding uh, bioprosthetic aortic valves, and the specific idea we looked into, or the project we worked on, has the following title, whether or not can bioprosthetic valve fracture for valve and valve taver achieve similar rates of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch when compared to index taver for native aortic valve stenosis. So just to quickly go through the background as we will build up the talk this evening, the first part is really understanding the, the basis of why we looked into the, the specific idea of valve and valve fracture. So over the last 15 years, the uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, TAVR, uh, procedure has expanded into younger and lower risk patients. Uh, as you commonly have heard, that has become a good alternative to surgical aortic valve replacements. And there's more increasing indications to patients who are intermediate risks recently, and that can include uh, females of reproductive age, also uh, patients who are uh, in the you know, 65 or older range as well. The figure on the right just depicts a basic idea of uh, aortic stenosis and, and different than what the TAVR prosthesis would look like. This here is a, of course, three cusp aortic valve. So um, as you can tell, it's calcified, it's stenotic and scarred. And so with the aortic valve stenosis, there is a fixed uh, obstruction or, you know, the valve is really narrowed here, which gives, creates a lot of high pressure for the LV to create. And of course can lead to modeling and LVH here. And of, on the very right, this is your transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So this is the TAVR coming retroaortic, coming up the aorta here from the groin below in the femoral artery. And this is the delivery of the valve. Uh, there's a catheter that will have a balloon. The balloon is carrying the valve apparatus and I'll delve into the valve apparatus in one second. The background of um, TAVR really it took off after some trials. Um, it was a series of trials that are called the partner trials. The earliest one is partner 1B here on the right and it went forward to partner three. Partner 1B was built the, the, um, the foundation for TAVR it looked at patients who have high risk of surgical mortality. And that is calculated based on the STS score, that is the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Scoring System. It's a quite uh, you know, broad calculator. You can find it online, but it looks at a lot of factors regarding a patient, including their age, the type of surgery, uh, blood work, you know, a whole host of factors that predicts the score. And just to highlight here, as you see the label, the STS score, uh, lower than 4% is the low surgical risk mortality. Intermediate is 4 to 10. High is 10 to 15%. And extreme is really above 15% of uh, SDS score. So partner 1B, was it. what it did is just look at patients who are extreme or inoperable risk. They're, they're prohibitive risk from proceeding with surgery. And it looked at TAVR outcomes in them. Um, then partner 1A was a second trial. And partner 2A, which is more um, bigger landmark because it had a larger patient pool. And then of course there's partner three, but what it did is just look at the TAVR outcomes in patients with different SDS scores as you see here. And that led to the expanding role of TAVR, uh, especially as we developed newer devices, newer valves, it showed that there's decreased complications, you know, pulse intervention, and of course it's minimally invasive. This uh, chart here just details some of the, you know, all those trials in some greater detail. Um, so partner 1B, as we discussed, it was about 358 patients that looked at TAVR versus standard therapy, medical therapy, and it used the Sapien valve, which is one type of a TAVR prosthesis. 
and it looked at all cause deaths as the endpoint and the one year outcome for TAVR, which is you know all cause deaths with 30% standard therapy was 50.7%. So you know the five year outcome was even you know better. So TAVR was 71.8% and of course you know standard therapy was 93%. As trials went on further, we had 1A and 2A, and of course, all the way up to partner three and specific studies like Evolute Low Risk, which looks at the certain type of valve for TAVR prosthesis versus a surgical aortic valve. But I'll call your attention to the focus of this, at least in terms of background, to the partner 2A trial, because that included the largest pool of 2,032 patients, and it used the Sapien XD you know, type of prosthesis, and it looked at two things, all cause death and disabling stroke within two years after the procedure and it compared it to surgical aortic valve replacement and as you can see here it was 19 percent you know call, all cause death and disabling stroke over two years with TAVR uh, versus SAVR which was 21 percent and you know they broke it up into different cohorts but it's even better outcomes with the transfemoral approach femoral approach so there is improved outcome of TAVR compared to SAVR and so that built the foundation for TAVR to become a standard of care. And this is just a you know, recap of the above point that they partner 2A, it was 2,000 patients, and it looked at severe symptomatic AS, uh, patients who were intermediate risk, um, based surgical risk based on the STS score, which is specifically 4 to 8%. And of course, it's comparing TAVR, which is you know, a percutaneous transcatheter through the femoral artery here compared to open surgical aortic valve replacement. The two types of aortic valve uh, TAVR, you know, prosthesis are the balloon expandable valve, which is uh, produced by Edward Sapien, uh, also known as the Edward Sapien valve, but from life sciences, and of course the Medtronic core valve, and these are self-expanding. So the big difference here, there's a few things we'll point out in the balloon expandable, it requires a balloon to deploy the valve, you know, inflate the balloon to put the valve in its place. And of course the self-expanding, you just have to deliver. Um, to briefly go over the, the structures of both in the balloon expand, expandable valve here, you see that it's uh, the, the struts here, the skeleton of the valve is made of high radial strength cobalt chromium, which is something to note because some patients do have certain allergies. Also the material here in, in the prosthesis and the valve itself in the middle plane here is made from bovine pericardial tissue. And the other to note here compared to the self-expanding core valve, the frame height, as you can tell the metal part here per se, the frame of the valve is short relative to the Medtronic core, which is you know longer in length as you see here. And this is designed to respect the anatomy and minimize conduction system disease. As we will see later on, that's one of the things we look, you know, that may happen is any um, heart block or conduction disease issues. The self-expanding, as we said, the Medtronic core valve it's made of this nitinol frame, which is nickel titanium, so it's different from cobalt chromium in the balloon expandable sapien valve. And of course, the prosthetic tissue here, it is made from pig heart tissue. So um, from our experience, we, we often see Edward sapien valve used. Um, and then regarding the post aver management, as, uh, as it will relate to our later part of the talk, um, Based on the ACC uh, expert opinion, so after anti for antithrombotic therapy after TAVR, patients should be on Plavix 75 milligrams daily for six months for balloon expandable valves and for three months for the self-expanding valves. So that's, remember, the one on the right here is the Medtronic self-expanding and the one on the left is the balloon expandable. And then they should also be on aspirin for, uh, 75 to 100 milligrams for life. Similarly, for echo, um, you have to look at the valve gradients after the deployment of the valve. Um, so after the TAVR is deployed, so post-TAVR, before hospital discharge, a patient ought to have an uh, echocardiogram done. Also, 30 days from the procedure, and of course, annually thereafter, although that might be different. The important highlight here that I will contrast to the above points is anticoagulation. And there was one specific trial that looked at anticoagulation in TAVR, it was called the Galileo trial, and it looked at Zeralto in particular, or Viroxaban. And what it showed that there was increased risk of death, thrombolytic complications, and high risk of bleeding compared to a platelet-based therapy. So as a standard of care, anticoagulation is not used often, um, if at all, with TAVR management afterwards. 
Now, as the TAVR role expands into younger and younger patients, um, the patients themselves, of course, outlive the shelf life of the implanted valve. So the valve will start to wear and tear or undergo certain pathophysiology, which are always you know, continuing as happened with the native valve. And this is from structural degradation and restenosis. So I'm gonna briefly go through the figure here. Uh, you know, there's wear and tear and degradation within the valve cusps here. There's calcification, uh, which is, you know, from chronic buildup here. Panis, which is core formation and uh, can be an issue with bioprosthetic valves, thrombus formation. And that can be one of the scenarios w where endocalculation can be attempted, you know. And then of course, endocarditis, if it develops on the bioprosthetic valves. So these are all common processes that develop uh, within the prosthetic valve and over long-term will cause stenosis and uh, need to be re-intervened on. So therefore, one of the concerns is prosthetic valve intervention. So as we put TAVR valves in younger and younger patients, there will be increased need for valve re-intervention on the bioprosthetic valves as the patients age. And in one of the earlier trials um, done by Rodriguez and Cabela et al., what it did is looked at 10-year follow-up for 672 patients. Um, mean age was 72 years old, but you looked at SAVR between 2002 and 2004. So you looked at about 700 patients who had surgical aortic valve replacement. What they noted was that 64% had died, um, and the majority of those were non-cardiovascular. But the other important point here is that 7.3% underwent redo valve intervention. So after having gone surgical aortic valve replacement, about 7.3% of those patients needed redo surgical aortic valve or a valve and valve TAVR. So that led to the developing inception of valve and valve TAVR. And what that is, is it's, it's a valve and valve transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So it's VIV TAVR. Okay. And it was initially approved for patients who had prior implanted prosthesis. And at that point in time was mostly high surgical risk patients for redo surgical aortic valve replacements. So as this figure shows, you know, just to put the idea here, there's this, a surgical aortic valve uh, prosthesis and the develops, for example, stenosis or regurgitation, or it could develop, you know, calcification or degeneration, and therefore it will need to be intervened upon. So the two options back then, of course, was either redo SAVR, um, and as you see here, there's two valves overlying each other, or you do a valve and valve TAVR where you deliver a transcatheter aortic valve through the surgical aortic valve. To do that, one of the routine things we always look at and every operator as they plan this procedure is of course a is imaging studies and that is the CT TAVR protocol. And that is just a comp ECG gated cardiac CT scan and whole body angiography. So what it does, it you know, it evaluates the aorta and the iliofemoral arteries to ensure adequate caliber of sheath delivery. It looks at the height of the coronary arteries to minimize any obstruction of the ostium of the coronary artery from the apparatus of the valve. It also looks at the aortic valve annulus and root anatomy to appropriately size the valves. So what does that mean in terms of images? See here on this very leftmost panel, um, we measure this coronary uh, like height uh, and what it is, it just you look at the, the annulus or that frame of the aortic valve by that purple line, you know, violet line here where I'm pointing. And then you see where the coronary artery branches off the aorta or comes off the aorta and that's the coronary height. So just, this is one factor that matters because you're gonna be putting a prosthesis in this region. And then of course, we have to measure the uh, long and short dimensions of the, uh, the annulus here in the second panel. And in the third panel, where I'm pointing is that you see, this is just to exemplify calcifications in the iliofemoral you know, the branches. So the way that have a prosthesis is delivered, you have to put it through a long, large bore sheath, which is 14 French. So if the vessel is calcified or stenotic or occluded, of course, that pr proves challenging to deliver the system. And the last image here in the reconstructed CT in orange is the aortic arch anatomy, because the anatomy can make it more challenging or prove it to be difficult to come around the turn of the arch and deploy the valve successfully. So that is so. If, then we've built the premise that you know surgical aortic valves uh, might need another valve, so valve and valve. The other concept we're going to introduce here is patient prosthesis mismatch. Um, so what it is, it's one of the challenges in valve and valve TAVR is 
patient prosthesis mismatch, which we denoted here as PPM. And what that is, is the effective orifice area of the implanted valve is too small with respect to the patient for adequate systemic flow. And mis patient prosthesis mismatch is a prominent issue in TAVR because the true internal diameter of the orifice is reduced with implantation of the second valve. So therefore you're reducing this indexed orifice area. So what does that mean? I'll, I'll lay that, that out right now. These are just some images um, here. This is, uh, yeah, this is balloon expandable valve on the right. Uh, as you remember, this was what we looked at in the earlier slide. And here's the self-expanding valve in panel A. And this is what it looks like below in panel C in the long axis on imaging and the top is echo. So back to the concept of effective orifice area. So as everything we do, you know, um, there's a lot of laws that we apply the conservation of mass to including echo and amongst many other aspects. So if you look on this figure of the heart here, you have an area and then you have blood flow going through the LV outflow and then it goes into the, through the aortic valve to, to for systemic circulation through the aorta. So we could indirectly calculate the area here in red for the aortic valve. And that just from this continuity equation based on conservation of mass. And what that does, it just takes into consideration the, the area times the volume going into the um, aorta. And then you look at the area and the uh, velocity, I apologize. And it gives you, uh, the, you can calculate the area of the aortic valve. So what goes in must come out. And that's just simple um, physiology. But before we do valve and valve, we, we also estimate using this formula what the effective orifice area would be, which is A2 here, meaning how much opening of the aortic valve would you have if you have two prosthesis inputs. So why is mismatch important? Um, so patient prosthesis mismatch is an important outcome after TAVR because severe mismatch has been shown to have increased post-operative mortality compared to lower degrees of patient prosthesis mismatch. Uh, this here is a registry data from the SDS ACC that was developed together and it shows that patient outcomes may improve when steps are taken to reduce and limit patient prosthesis mismatch. You see on the graph, this is months from procedure up to 12 months and on the y-axis mortality. And as you see how the two curves diverge, um, here the mortality is 17.2% in severe patient prosthesis mismatch and mortality is 15.8% with no or moderate patient prosthesis mismatch. So, you know, it's quite significant difference of a year out from the procedure. So there's, we tried to appropriately size or look at the area of the orifice of the valve. So, so far right now, we've kind of built up the concept that, you know, you have a valve, you might need to put a second valve in it, um, but how do we maximize this and effective orifice area? So we reduce mismatch. So as, as the topic of this study, we, we were interested in bioprosthetic valve fracture. So this is a technique that involves fracturing the ring or the struts of the previously implanted valve with high pressure balloon inflation, and therefore it increases the internal diameter and the effective orifice area. What that means is before you put the second valve through this first valve, you deliver a balloon system, as you see here, I'm pointing to the bottom left panel, um, you would deliver a balloon um, and then that balloon you would inflate or you know, uh, use contrast as we do in the lab, you inflate the balloon at high pressure and you exert so much uh, you know, Laplace law. So you, you put pressure on the prosthetic ring there and you cause a fracture, which is this little gap here in figure A. Similarly, this is just a model on the right side. So you see the balloon is inflating and then eventually in B here, it leads to this break in the ring of the valve. And so you've given yourself more room for growth of that, you know, ring or annulus. So you have more area and that's the goal for you to put a second prosthetic valve. Um, I can, I'll be showing you a video briefly uh, in a minute, but this is what the apparatus looks like on the outside um, is that you would have two, you see these two, um, one is syringe and the syringe is connected to an end deflator by this stopcock circled in red. And it's filled with some contrast, and that's how you see it under fluoroscopy, under X-ray. And what you do is these two the syringe and insufflator are connected by a tubing to the balloon, which is on the side here in yellow. And so what you do is you inject the contrast from the syringe into the tubing, and then you lock it. So that's why the stopcock here, the blue, is pointing down. And then, of course, you use this insufflator to continue increasing the pressure in the balloon 
And as you see, the balloon gets bigger here. Um, and then what you would see under fluoroscopy is, you know, in this image A, you see the two dark dots here on the, you know, wire uh, is, uh, is the balloon. And in B, you see the balloon being inflated and it's getting larger, as you can see. And I want to put your attention to the black arrows here in, in B, in panel B. You see this little buckling or invagination within the balloon. So the balloon is being compressed by that prosthetic valve. Eventually, as you increase the pressure, what will happen is the balloon will sort of overcome that strain from the valve and it causes disruption in that valve apparatus. And you could kind of see it, I'll, I'm pointing it with the arrow. So in panel B, you could kind of see this black line here be continuous, almost like a crown. But in panel C, after you fracture it, you see you lose that crown looking uh, appearance. And of course, now you have a bigger orifice area. Um, I'm just gonna quickly pull up a video that shows this concept. Um, so, so as you see here, the, the the balloon is being inflated. You see the, just keep watching. You'll see this give in, meaning it will crack. Keep watching. And right there, you saw that. You saw this area here kind of grew. I'll, I'll play it back quickly for a few more seconds. Watch the ring here in this area. Boom, right? So that's fracture. All right, back to the... So, this is, you know, a recap of what I discussed before we look into the data we gathered with Abi. Um, it just show what we're saying is there's an expanding role for TAVR, which is now being utilized in younger and lower risk surgical patients. And valve and valve TAVR could be utilized in patients who had previous surgical valve or a previous transcatheter aortic valve as due to valve dysfunction. Fracking of the bioprosthetic valve can yield a greater effective orifice area, right? So once you fracture, you're giving yourself more lumen to put a, a prosthesis in, and therefore you reduce patient prosthesis mismatch. And most importantly, is that severe patient prosthesis mismatch is associated with the increased morbidity and mortality in valve reintervention patients. And with that, I'll hand over the data and our findings to Abhi. Thanks, Katie. So moving forward, back to our clinical question, because we did go through a lot of background details and just to bring everybody you know, up to speed. Um, so the question we looked at is, can bioprosthetic valve fracture achieve similar rates of acceptable patient prosthesis mismatch when compared to indexed TAVR for aortic, native aortic valve stenosis? And the reason I say acceptable patient prosthesis mismatch is, um, you, you always expect some uh, mismatch after valve intervention because with every um, you know, implantation, you are reducing that true internal diameter. So that's why usually in the literature, you won't see you know, no patient prosthesis mismatch. The lowest category is usually mild. But what's acceptable is, is uh, hopefully less than you know, moderate and definitely less than severe. So uh, with regards to the methods of our study, this was a retrospective study um, and we included patients at this institution who had undergone valve and valve TAVR from the years 2016 to uh, 2020. Um, and they were further subdivided into whether or not they had bioprosthetic valve fracture done intraprocedure. Um, and they were further, these groups were matched um, uh, with uh, an age, sex, and valve size match control group of patients who had undergone primary TAVR for native aortic valve stenosis. So in each of the groups, as you can see, we had uh, 21 patients that either underwent uh, bioprosthetic valve fracture, did not undergo bioprosthetic valve fracture, or patients who had just indexed TAVR for native valves, AS. And in terms of the gradation of patient prosthesis mismatch, the accepted values are um, shown on the table to the right. So mild uh, indexed effective orifice area greater than 0.85 denotes mild PPM, um, less than 0.65 centimeters squared per meter squared denotes more severe PPM, and then moderate falls in between the two from 0.65 to, to 0.85. And the way you calculate that is um, using the continuity equation, which Fadi had mentioned earlier, to calculate an orifice area uh, 
that the flow will be leaving, and then you just divide it by the body surface area of the patient. Moving on to our results. Uh, this is a little bit of a busy table, but basically we had the three groups that I mentioned earlier, the group that did not get fracture um, during their valve and valve procedure, the group that did get fracture during the valve and valve procedure, and then the native group that got TAVR for the first time for uh, you know, primary aortic stenosis. So we looked at a couple of things, the aortic valve area, um, of the three groups. And as you can see, the valve area of the bioprosthetic fracture group and the index TAVR group were, were larger uh, and fairly similar to each other, um, which is why this p-value is non-significant because this is comparing the bioprosthetic valve fracture group to the native group. But when you look at the fracking group to the non-fracking group um, for the groups that got the valve and valve procedure, the valve area was much larger in the fracking group as we, um, with a you know significant p-value as we uh, expect. Moving down to the indexed effective orifice area um, uh, between the three groups, overall the the uh, IEOA was larger in the fracking group as well as the index TAVR group, um, and it was also larger than the uh, the valve and valve group that did not get fracking with a p-value that trended towards significance. And I'll talk about why, um, you know, we just found it trended towards significance later, at least our theories as to why. But in terms of defining PPM, of the 21 patients in each group, nine patients in the group that got valve and valve TAVR without bioprosthetic valve fracture uh, had severe, moderate to severe PPM, meaning an IEOA of less than the 0.85 centimeter squared per meter squared value we discussed earlier, whereas only two out of the 21 patients in the fracking group had more than mild PPM and about three out of the 21 patients in the, uh, the, native, the native AS group had um, more, than, more than mild PPM and that was a significant result. So just to recap the results in um, uh, more of a systematic format, in the BVF group, as I said, only two patients had moderate or more severe uh, mismatch compared to many more, uh, nine in the non-BVF group, and then three in the native uh, TAVR group, um, which was significantly lower, and that's what we kind of expected to find. And furthermore, there was no instances of like adverse events, including things like aortic root rupture, coronary occlusion, or pericardial effusion post-procedure in our study population. Um, and one of the kind of conclusions we reached based on this is that bioprosthetic valve fracture uh, can lead to significant reduction in moderate to severe PPM during valve and valve TAVR achieving uh, comparable rates to index TAVR for native aortic stenosis. And um, in patients requiring valve reintervention, uh, bioprosthetic valve fracture should be strongly considered, especially for smaller surgical valves uh, with suitable uh, aortic root anatomy to achieve optimal valve hemodynamics. And I'll talk about that a little bit later too. The other thing I wanted to point out is um, since this is a fairly new, uh, new concept, it's only been done, uh, you know, a couple of times in the last few years, is the timing of fracture intraprocedurally during valve and valve uh, TAVR. So the fracking can occur prior to deployment of the new valve or after deploying the new valve. And whether, which is optimal uh, with regards to when to frack is, is not really clear. So fracking the bioprosthetic ring before um, deploying the new valve may be justified to avoid su subjecting the transcatheter heart valve to high pressure balloon inflation. Although on the other hand, this also may increase the risk of embolization of debris from the degenerated bioprosthetic valve um, and even acute valvular insufficiency uh, that could you know, have um, adverse hemodynamic consequences. On the other hand, fracking after um, deploying the, the second valve uh, allows you to assess 
um, hemodynamics post-implantation to see how they change in, in the lab. And it may allow for more optimal expansion of the, the transcatheter heart valve. However, one of the concerns is that um, fracking after placing the, uh, the internal valve may lead to leaflet damage, both of, of the new valve affecting long-term durability because, you know, as we've kind of said, there haven't been any long-term uh, great studies uh, with regards to valve and valve intervention as it's a fairly new, um, new um, technique. And we looked at one of the, in our background research, one of the things we looked at was there was a, an analysis of about 75 fracking cases, um, and which said that fracking after implantation was an in, independent predictor of lower final mean gradient and presumably due to more optimal expansion of the transcatheter heart valve. I will say in a lot of the patients that, you know, were included in our study, the fracking was done after the um, the uh, the new valve was already expanded. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about how does index valve size of the usual, the, the surgically um, implanted, the first valve uh, affect outcomes. So patients with small surgical bioprostheses, like around less than 21 millimeter true internal diameter, who underwent valve and valve TAVR seem to have higher residual gradients and higher mortality compared to other patients. And obviously these outcomes were attributed to increased rates of severe or more than moderate patient prosthesis mismatch. Um, and during valve and valve TAVR, often the new valve has a bigger internal diameter than the old valve actually in order to aid expansion of the effective orifice area and remodel the um, the uh, aortic valve plane such that you know uh, it reduces the rates of patient prosthesis mismatch. And if you look at the figure to the right, it's this is a kind of a CT reconstruction of a patient who had a valve and valve procedure. Their original surge this is after it's been fracked, but their original surgical valve was a 19 millimeter Edwards Magna, and the valve that was implanted. Uh, via transcatheter was a 23 millimeter core, core valve Evolute R. So the valve had a bigger true internal diameter. Now, obviously, if you didn't crack it, the valve isn't going to be um, able to expand uh, optimally even because it's got a, low, a higher true internal diameter. So after fracking, it disrupts this valve ring but allows the, the diameter to increase um, and hopefully decrease patient prostatic mismatch. So this table here is um, looking at the fracking pressures of different surgical valves because they are, they are quite different. So I'm just gonna focus on the green ones here, the ones that are frackable. So the St. Jude BioCore, the Medtronic Mosaic, the Soren Mitra Flow, the Edwards Magna Ease, and the regular Edwards Magna. And usually what you can see is the size of the valves that they looked at were the smaller surgical valves because they knew that those had, you know, they were uh, supposed that those had more rates of patient prosthetic mismatch in order to explain the higher mortality in patients with smaller implanted valves. And uh, they used um, either the true balloon or the Atlas gold balloon to frack the valves. And then this picture on the right here shows the valves after they've been fracked, what they look like under cynic. Um, and with you know high pressure inflations, some didn't need as high as others, obviously, but all of these, the ones in blue, were able to be were able to be fracked. And um, you know, obviously, TAVR and valve and valve TAVR doesn't come without its complications. And one of the uh, you know great sources of both results and complications comes from the VIVID registry. This is a registry of all valve and valve interventions done, at least in the United States. Um, and uh, one of the things that happens post TAVR and, and post valve and valve intervention is uh, rates of heart block and, uh, and resulting per permanent pacemaker implantation. So the risk of permanent pacemaker implantation in valve and valve TAVR was actually relatively low around 
And unlike native valve TAVR, it actually decreased with the use of the newer generation transcatheter heart valve uh, systems, which exhibited similar low pacemaker uh, implantation rates, regardless of the valve type. Just to note, older age, larger transcatheter heart valves, and independently, patients with baseline right bundles were associated with an increased risk of um, pacemaker implantation post procedure. Uh, with the trend towards higher pacemaker implantation rates and after device malposition and with the use of earlier generation, early generation systems. What about if you stratify it based on index TAVR and valve and valve TAVR? So one of the systematic reviews we looked at, um, overall rate of pacemaker implantation after index TAVR, as I said before, de uh, differed by the type of valve. So the earlier generation Medtronic core valves had higher risk, ranging from 16 to 37%. And it actually remained relatively high with even the newer generation Medtronic core valve or the Evolute R systems, ranging from 14 to you know, almost 27%. The newer Edward Sapien three valves, which are a lot of the ones we use here in our uh, TAVRs and valve and valve interventions, resulted in a lower risk uh, from four to 24%. And then referencing our vivid registry data, the rates of pacemaker implantation, as I said, in the valve and valve TAVRs were about as high as 6.4% post-procedure, lower than most of the index TAVR rates, which seems to suggest that patients who, it raises an, another interesting question, maybe patients who tolerated a first bioprosthesis implantation without pacemaker, um, you know, complicate, without complications needing to have a pacemaker placed post-procedurally may be more protected against needing a pacemaker after valve reintervention based on either patient characteristics or uh, valve characteristics. So this is just a, a figure taken from that vivid registry that I was talking about where they looked at about 2,000 patients with um, without prior pacemakers that got valve and valve uh, interventions this didn't really, this didn't stratify based on fracking or not, but what I wanted to point out is that the overall rate was 6.4% higher with the earlier generation valves, lower with the newer generation valves. And then some of the independent risk factors that I said was before was baseline right bundle, larger transcatheter heart valve, and older age. And uh, moving on to some more uncommon complications, one of the things that I needed to, we need to discuss, especially when doing valve and valve or even ta index TAVR is coronary obstruction, which is a rare but very morbid complication of these uh, transcatheter heart procedures. And basically it occurs more frequently in patients with prior stentless or stented bioprostheses that have an externally, externally mounted leaflets and less so in stented bioprostheses with internally mounted leaflets. And also if you have a virtual um, annulus to uh, coronary ostium distance, this distance right here from the virtual aortic annulus up to where the coronary um, takes off, that's what we referred to before on that CT TAVR that Fady showed with the height of the coronaries being an important factor pre-intervention. If that was lower down, then uh, the rates of coronary obstruction were greater. So this figure on the right shows that in a patient with a forgiving sinus of Valsalva, which is this area right above the aortic valve plane and the root, um, that even if you implanted a, a transcatheter heart valve, blood would be able to flow around it into the, the coronary ostia. Whereas patients with a narrower sinus that had the valve kind of flush against the um, the walls of the aorta, and you know, it, regardless regarding how, and with people who have a shorter valve to ostia distance, they can un have coronary obstruction, which can be catastrophic. So, moving on to some of the limitations of our study is that although valve and valve procedures are just a small subset of um, the total transcatheter heart procedures. Uh, we had a small kind of sample size with just 21 patients in each arm. Um, and another in, uh, important point to bring up is I went over the BM, I went over the cutoffs for, um, or actually Fady went over the cutoffs for the, the uh, 
patient prosthesis mismatch gradations before, which was 0.85 and 0.65 as being less severe and then mild. But um, there's actually been studies showing that patients who are obese can tolerate a more severe quote unquote patient prosthesis mismatch without adverse outcomes. So in the obese population with patients with BMI greater than 30, the accepted cutoffs for mild are actually um, greater than 0.7, not greater than 0.85. And the cutoffs for severe are less than or equal to 0.55, not less than um, uh, 0.65. So that was one thing that we did not kind of stratify for. Um, another is that we didn't stratify based on the type of valve being implanted. As I said, most of the valves that we implant here, at least in the study population, were the balloon expandable Edward Sapien three valves, although that we did have some self-expanding, mostly metronic core valves. Um, we didn't stratify based on the existing surgical valve dimensions, meaning we had data based on you know what the how the size of the valve implanted was, but not really showing that how many were smaller versus larger, the ones that were less than 21 millimeters versus the ones that were larger. Uh, we also didn't stratify based on the timing of bioprosthetic valve fracture in the BVF group um, that I mentioned before, you know, timing being something that was uh, a little unclear as to which is the most optimal way to do it. And there are some valves that actually aren't frackable at all, so the ones that we talked about in the blue column, if you remember from earlier, we talked about these valves, but the, um, the Magna, the Magna Ease, the Paramount 2800, Microflow, Mosaic, Biocore, there are some that are remodelable, but not frackable, the Trifecta, Carpentier, Edwards, Inspiris, and the older Paramount 2700. And there are some that are non-frackable and non-remodelable, which are the Hancock II and the Amelis. So, it, you know, we didn't, kind of look at whether the ones that were in the fracking group were just patients that were had these frackable valves um, versus patients in the non-fracking group um, that were stratified there just because they couldn't be fracked, not because they um, you know, were truly randomized, I guess. So I know we you know, also presented a lot of information. So just another summary slide. So in our study, we looked at 42 patients in total that had valve and valve TAVR. They were divided into two equal subgroups based on whether or not they underwent intraprocedural valve fracture or not. We compared this cohort to an equal sized group of patients that were getting indexed TAVR for native aortic stenosis matched for age, sex, and the size of the new transcatheter heart valve being implanted. So we found that the calculated aortic valve area uh, was significantly larger and the rates of severe patient prosthetic mismatch were much less in the index TAVR and the fracking group compared to the non-fracking valve and valve group. The indexed EOA being less severe also trended towards significance between the fracking and the non-fracking groups. Um, it, the, one of the reasons which we think maybe it wasn't completely significant was that we didn't stratify uh, with regards to something like obesity, which can um, definitely skew the data. And then both common and uncommon adverse events, such as pacemaker implant and coronary obstruction um, are associated with TAVR. Although uh, valve and valve to date, the data shows that there's a lower incidence of pacemaker implantation post valve and valve procedure then post index TAVR. Uh, you know, why that may be it is kind of you know, open to debate. One of the reasons I mentioned earlier, one of the supposed reasons was maybe the patients who uh, you know, survived a first <laughs> valve surgery without implantation of a pacemaker were more protected against it. The other thing is the earlier transcatheter heart valves were larger and a little more prone to disturbing the conduction system. The newer ones aren't. And so the valve and valve procedures are only done with the newer valves as well. And so some future directions for expanding, you know, this uh, includes we, you know, right now, most of the transcatheter heart valve interventions are done in patients with tricuspid aortic stenosis. Um, some of the new indications could be looking at patients with tricuspid aortic valve stenosis, 
um, aortic insufficiency. There is a valve that's not FDA approved called the Jenna valve that is kind of um, in, you know, in early phases of seeing whether or not it can it can help in severe AI. Um, moderate AS causing cardiomyopathy and heart failure, so not technically severe, but um, enough to cause uh, uh, adverse cardiac remodeling and asymptomatic severe AS. Just a point about the bicuspid valve. One of the re you know original reasons that it was thought that it wouldn't work well for bicuspid anatomy is that the the, the new the um, the transcatheter heart valves the way they're designed is to optimally sit in three cusps and not in two cusps and kind of a raffe, which a lot of bicuspid valves have. And so that kind of concludes the presentation. I hope uh, uh, you know we were able to kind of impart something onto people who haven't uh, know a lot about this topic, but um, be happy to take any questions and thank you. Well, thank you guys. Uh, Abby, Fadi, <clears throat> you guys did a great job. Um, I know that I pulled Dr. Hakeem and Dr. Javri from their busy schedule, and I know we have a few minutes. I was going to invite them to, and I know they mentored you guys, so I wanted to invite them to come in and sort of make a comment. Um, and then if there's a few minutes, you guys can entertain questions from the audience. I will tell you one thing, um, <clears throat> two, two things. Um, you guys seamlessly introduced a lot of information, and um, you were very collaborative with each other, which I think is one of the things that we have to learn to do research. Um, and second, I think you took a potentially very complicated topic, and I actually feel like I understand it. So with that, uh, Joseph, if you want to bring Dr. Hakeem and Dr. Chowdhury in, um, I know they mentored these two guys. Maybe they can um, add some comments before we conclude our grand rounds. Dr. Hakeem and Dr. Chowdhury, if you don't mind turning on your video, I will be able to add you to the discussion. And then, Fadi, if you don't mind um, removing uh, your slides. While, while they're coming in, guys, do you, do you envision in the short term that we'll be able to kind of, uh, as we make these decisions, do you think we'd be able to talk to patients and reassure them in the future that we will have some type of intervention that, uh, you know, we have a limited lifespan of a bioprosthetic valve. Do you think in younger people, will we assure them that there'll be an intervention in the future that will increase the longevity of the valve that they've received? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, as the valve material and like the companies become more uh, advanced and learning from prior uh, older generation valves that hopefully in the future, these newer valves will be more durable um, and less prone to degradation um, to, so that, you know, maybe the need for valve re-intervention won't be as high in the future. Do you also think that, um, do you also think that in your, go ahead, Vinny, I'm sorry. Sorry, no, also the issue is tavern valves, like transcatheter valves are not easily explantable. I know some places do it, but it's proven challenging. So you're kind of cornered into optimizing what you can. And that's why fracturing the valve is, is a sort of a novel and interesting yeah. option because it's innovative, you know? Can I add something while we're waiting for the guys to join us? Do, do you think that there was a learning period between uh, the time that people did fracture the existing valve and uh, didn't, and maybe that's why there was fracturing and not fracturing. Is that now been standard of care? That's an excellent point. I think it's um, quite frankly operator dependent. It depends on the comfort, the apparatus, the access to the technology, but it's not standard of care in many places. No. And with that, now I'll stop playing structural okay. cardiologist on TV and I'll open the forum to Dr. Hakeem. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, that was uh, a very uh, good presentation, both uh, uh, Fede and uh, Abi. I never uh, imagined myself giving you a compliment over three years. <laughs> but, uh, so uh, just a couple of things. Um, I think it is uh, 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 a really interesting topic. Uh, not much has been... Um, uh, published uh, on it. There, there are a few small series, but um, um, 
the routine really is if there is a valve that can be uh, fractured, uh, you almost always want to uh, fracture it unless uh, there are anatomical um, factors that would uh, preclude it. Like you've got a 95 year old and she's got a, a really uh, a constricted uh, sinus tubular junction. Uh, in that case, uh, really, if the if uh, if the if the previously placed valve is severely degenerated and it's got a high gradient, uh, then uh, just putting a new prosthesis, um, even a twenty uh, a millimeter uh, valve, and bringing the gradient down uh, to <clears throat> uh, to below twenty is is good enough. Uh, obviously, things are different if somebody has. Um, a more favorable anatomy and a, a longer life expectancy, in which case um, uh, the goal really is to get as ideal a hemodynamic result as possible. The second point uh, about um, what's the timing, we almost always, and most centers would almost always uh, 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 deploy the valve um, uh, and then uh, uh, fracture it uh, afterwards. We don't do it uh, pre uh, for the reasons that were well covered by uh, Abhi. Um, the question I have for you guys is, you've, you've, you've put together um, a, a good series, albeit um, small, but the, the literature is fairly scarce. So what do you plan on doing with this data? Are you, have you presented this? Are you going to write this up? Um, obviously, you're going to need a lot more stats. Uh, so I can tell you've put in a lot of hard work, but if you don't publish it, then that is all the hard work down the drain. Um, so that is something I want you to uh, very carefully consider. I mean, last year at oh, ACC, um, we work with Ashok, uh, who's on nicely now. And uh, no, there is a, you know, our intention is to just write this up as a, you know, manuscript and hopefully get it published. <coughs> Hi, uh, can you hear me? Sorry, my, yeah, we my, hear I have you. some sort of friends that is. So this is, I must uh, compliment you guys for doing an excellent job. Um, so let me ask you a quick question. Um, the, I think what we forget it's a very hot procedure, sexy, everyone wants to do it. It's a very, very team approach, you know? Um, let's say you have a, someone with a 19 millimeter mitral flow, which has an externally mounted leaflet, and someone with a small coronary sinus. And even if this guy or lady is 82 years old with some risk factors, Maybe it is a better idea for this patient to do a surgical valve, redo valve, the, uh, you know, a basilica procedure to lacerate the leaflets or do a snorkeling of the stent um, or, or all those high risk techniques. And we don't know the longevity of these valve in valve procedures. To know, uh, and, you know, in our case, we didn't come up with complications, but some of the complications are really scary. You know? Some of the complications include uh, aortic root rupture, patient dying on the table, and uh, and having a uh, pacemaker, uh, which is probably the least uh, of all problems, having a bad stroke, you know? So I think uh, for all these procedures, what is important is the lifetime management, the concept of lifetime management of patients. The first time around 65 years, yes, everyone wants to do a TAVR, but if you look at the CT and if they have a, uh, a small root, maybe uh, you have to think twice whether you give a surgical valve and then and then face the consequences of valve in valve seven, eight years down the line? Or maybe should you push the surgeons to do a root enlargement procedure and put in a baby, you know, uh, design for fracking, uh, easier to put valve in valve, but I think these are all interesting topics. So the heart team approach, giving your own CT is, Ashuk, we're kind of losing you a little bit. That's the sound of the uh, the valve fracture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, definitely makes a good point.
Go ahead, Abby. Sorry, what was? No, that? I was just saying he he makes a good point because the the whole point of fracking the valve is to optimize the area of flow. So if you can achieve that with root enlargement in a patient with a very small um, orifice yeah. to begin with, it, you know, it may be better long term than than um, the transcatheter options for sure. There's a couple of case reports like that um, out there. That yeah, was. I, think, I also think what Ashok was trying to say is that a comprehensive, you know. Uh, multidisciplinary approach to the decision is important also to select your patients. I think Abdul, is that what he was yeah. trying to, I think that's what he was trying to communicate. Uh, yeah, it was on, actually on the ACC guideline, like it's like a class one, if someone meets criteria for aortic valve replacement, that it'd be discussed in a, in a heart team, by a heart team. Well, um, I, for, See, I, I, I'll just make one, one, one point. more point. I think um, uh, Ashok said something that is extremely important, uh, especially for our, uh, these two fellows who are going to pursue uh, interventional and structural training. See, just like any new technology that comes in, uh, the uh, pendulum really swings one way and everybody is excited about it. Uh, we have done uh, very young patients, but then you have to ask yourself, uh, all the tower valves that we're, we're putting in native uh, uh, anatomy, um, these valves can't be fractured. Uh, these patients are going to require a tower, a tower uh, eight to 12 years later. So before you consider putting a tower valve in someone who's 58 or 59 years old, you've got to ask yourself what's going to happen when the patient is 67, 68. And especially if you are to put a 23 millimeter valve. And um, so those, those are some very important consideration. And that really uh, requires, because most patients, almost all of them now want uh, the catheter-based uh, valve therapy. Um, but um, having that discussion is extremely important. It's really the longevity of the patient. It's very easy to say, um, that, okay, you have symptomatic severe AS and your risk of mortality is 50% at two years. And we need to replace this valve. But uh, yes, that is important. The valve needs to be replaced, uh, but uh, you've got to really ask yourself uh, what the long-term outcomes are going to be and what kind of options are going to be available for these patients um, uh, in eight to 10 years when, when that fails. Uh, Abdul, to that point, and I, I know we have to be cognizant of time, if you have an otherwise healthy 50-year-old, would you still go with a surgical option? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I think the youngest patient that I've done was 43 years old uh, with severe AS, and the reason was because the patient had Down syndrome. Uh, patient with Down syndrome, he's in an institution facility, his longevity is barely another 10, 15 years. Uh, so, but most, most patients, um, uh, obviously you have a 56 year old who is on dialysis and has got a ton of comorbidities and the five-year outlook is poor. Now that may be someone you could make an exception and say, listen, he's not going to get a transplant is being on dialysis and chances that he's going to make another five years is pretty slim. So may as well consider it. So you've got to individualize that, but by and large, um, I think uh, uh, for most patients, I think like the guidelines specify it, you know, once you are above 75, then uh, considering tower in most patients is a very safe option. Uh, because if 10 years later that uh, fails, you know, most uh, uh, patients uh, really, uh, you know, I are, are, think are going to do all right. No, that's great. I, I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. Guys, uh, Abdul uh, Ashok, if he's here, thank you for your time. Guys, the one thing that Abdul said, you still have the benefit of their mentorship and help. So maybe you should take that advantage of them, get that manuscript done, because it seems like it's, because of the paucity of data, it will be very timely to get it done. You've done a lot of hard work. And I speak for everybody. You made this an easy experience for me because I'm stepping in for Dr. Sengupta today. But uh, next week, we're gonna have our next two senior fellows present. And, um, I want to thank everybody for joining us, Abdul, again. Thank you. And hopefully I didn't give you a bad CCU to deal with today. But uh, Actually, when you called me, we were actively courting a patient. Oh, I'm sorry. But, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> anyway, guys, All right. have a good evening. Uh, and thank, thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. you, Dr. Kim. Bye. Bye.
Thank you, guys.